Long service, and now if you like, let's go to our Bibles in uh, Proverbs chapter 21, Proverbs 21. You uh, know, uh, just kind of go back to the announcements, I was thinking a little bit more about, you know, the yard cleanup and whatnot, and, you know, I know it's uh, maybe difficult for people to, vol- to say that, hey, I want my yard clean, because, you know, people don't like to receive charity sometimes, and, you know, uh, of all people, I understand that, because I have to receive your charity every week to survive, so uh, it is not always an easy thing, but ultimately, uh, uh, so what I thought would do, instead of having people volunteer for, you know, or say, I want my house cleaned or whatnot, we'll just put a schedule together for everybody's house, and if you want it, then you can opt to stay on the list or you can opt out of the list, okay? So I'll make it easier for you, opt out instead of opting in, okay? A lot easier for people. So we'll, we'll put a list together and then I'll, I'll run that by you uh, next week and uh, we'll talk about that, okay? So when we just uh, sang that song, The Power to Heal Now and The Grace to Forgive, uh, basically I need that more than anything right now because tonight is what? Ladies' night. And we're going to talk about the contentious woman this morning. So I need the power of healing. I need the power of grace because I'm about to get beat up. All right. But in any case, (laughs) here we find ourselves in Proverbs chapter 21. And uh, the overall uh, topic that we have here in 21 is the defeat of the wicked. And then we also see the triumph and the establishment of the righteous. Again, the believer in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ going forward in this plan by the Lord. Again, Ultimately, the Lord is the one who uh, brings these things about, and He is our Savior, and then also He is the righteous and the just and the sovereign God. So uh, what we're going to do this morning is really combine uh, two verses that we find here in chapter 21, because uh, in our outline we call this a refrain, because it's a repeated uh, message that we have in this chapter. And rather than going over this ground twice and getting beat up twice, I'm going to save a little skin on my own back, and I'm just going to do it once, okay? So we're going to do it once, and then we're going to get on uh, to the other topics. But unfortunately, when we get to verse uh, chapter 25 and verse 24, the same verse that we have in verse 9 here is the same as 25, 24. It says, it is better to live in a corner of a roof than in the house shared with a contentious woman. And then, oh, by the way, we're going to see this once again in Proverbs chapter 27, a constant dripping on a day of steady rain and a contentious woman are alike. Okay, so now you know what we're going to be talking about. Now you know why I need your prayers. All right, but in any case... <clears throat> Let me also say this, when we close the book of Proverbs, whenever that may be, chapter 31 is all about the beautiful woman. So again, we're going to raise you all up as after we tear you all down, okay? So that's how the Lord works, that's how the military works, and it seems to be very effective, all right? But in uh, chapter 31, it's a great chapter in regard to the ladies and uh, uh, women, and especially virtuous ones, as we're studying. So as we uh, have been noting in chapter 20 and now in, in chapter 21, it's all about virtue, honor, integrity, righteousness, justice, operating in the love of God on a consistent basis. And these are the principles that we're seeing uh, throughout these two chapters. And now we get ourselves into verse 9 and also into verse 19, where we're seeing what not to do so that ultimately we know what to do. So let's read our own in uh, uh, chapter 21, beginning in verse 9. It says, It is better to live in a corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman, and then jump down to verse 19. It says, it is better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. So again, it's not bad enough just to live in a corner of your roof and then uh, with an angry woman, but now you've got to be out in the desert in the middle of nowhere, ultimately succumbing to the elements, and then also have an angry and a vexing woman to be living with you and to share a house with that type of individual. Now, just to get us started, I wanted to share with you some of the various translations that I found from other Bibles. Again, we use the NASB predominantly here, but there are other translations like the King James Bible, the Message Bible, the English Standard Version, a lot of other different translations, and they have a little slight variation uh, in regard to this verse, or these verses, I should say, that I did want to share with you this morning. So as I read these to you, again, to much to put up on the board, but as I read these to you, you can read along in our own and you see the differences uh, that we have in our NASB. 
or you may have an NIV or maybe even a King James. But I'll start off with a King James translation where there it says, it is better to dwell in a corner of a housetop, again, very similar, than a brawling woman in a wide house. And again, instead of saying shared, they use that, uh, they interpret that word as a wide house. Again, a big house. Again, a big, big house with a brawling woman. But that's the thing here, they have a brawling woman. Then in verse 19, it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Then the Holman Christian Standard Bible says, better to live in a corner of a roof than to share a house with a nagging wife. So that's the next word we get to see, a nagging wife, okay? Better to live in, verse 19, better to live in a wilderness than with a nagging and a hot-tempered wife. So again, these men who translated these Bibles just had a ball with this and coming up with all these different adjectives as they were going through this. All right, the Message Bible, okay? I don't know if you've ever seen the Message Bible, but it says, better to live alone in a tumble-down shack than share a mansion with a nagging spouse. And then verse 19, better to live in a tent in the wild than with a cross and petulant Spouse. Now, petulant means ill-tempered, sulky, and peevish uh, manners, okay? Then the English uh, Standard Translation or version, it says in verse 9, it's better to live in a corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome woman. So again, we're seeing all these different types of translations. And then verse 19, it says, better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and a fretful woman. And I love how they just keep coming up with these adjectives. A couple more for you. The Living Bible. It's better to live in a corner of an attic than with a crabby woman. I love that one. In a lovely home. And then in verse 19, better to live in the desert than with a quarrelsome, complaining woman. So there again, once we see. And if any of you are Spanish speaking, just to not leave you out, mejor es viver en un rincón del Torado. Torado, that's the word there. K N una casa con mayor rensiliosa. Rensiliosa, if you know anything about that. Then in verse 19, mayor es habeta en terrera deserta. Desert, desert, get it? Okay, deserta. K con mayor reconciliosa e molesta. Nobody found that funny, huh? <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. Molesta? But that means angry or contentious. All right, in any case, moving on with the big joke. All right, this is so what we're talking about this morning is the contentious, vexing, brawling, angry, nagging, hot-tempered, cross, petulant, quarrelsome, fretful, bitter-tongued, crabby, complaining, reconciliosa, molesta, that didn't go anywhere. Oh, and then also, if you just want to un understand what the Septuagint translation says, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, they use maximos woman, which means a warlike wife. And so that's who we're talking about this morning. <laughs> All right, so now you know why I need your prayers. All right, so uh, kind of getting into it a little bit and uh, yeah, getting through a little bit of the translation and also uh, getting some of the principles and precepts that we need to take away. Again, this is not the type of woman nor man that anyone should uh, certainly want to be or desire to be. And if you find yourself falling into these trends at all, again, you need to just check it, you know, confess it to the Lord, and then move off into a different direction. Now remember, Solomon is the writer of this, again, through the divine inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit. But Solomon, of any man that has ever lived, knows well about these things because he had over a thousand combined wives and concubine, concubines. So ultimately, he had a thousand women that he had to deal with each and every day. So he knew this better than any, any of us and all of us combined. So ultimately, when we have that phrase, it's better to live, again, we have a comparison here. It's better to live in a certain type of environment that we're about to see than to live with this type of woman or wife, as it were. And ultimately, that word live means uh, to dwell, to sit, to be, you know, to be in that place or in that location. And so it's better to live alone in a secluded corner of your house, as we have. Again, it says the rooftop. And the Hebrew there talks about, you know, they used to have flat roofs on their houses. They didn't have the pitch 
stitches like we would uh, today. You know, we might, you know, if we were to translate this, we might say up in the attic somewhere. But it, it's even worse, okay, because they had flat roofs. And it, it's basically saying, if, you know, on a flat roof, you go up to the top of that roof and you live just in one corner. And that's it. You can't go in the other three corners, just in that corner. And in that corner, you're what? You're, you're, you're open to the elements, whether it be cold or hot, rain, snow, you know, sleet, whatever the case may be. You're in that environment and you're in those elements. And it's better to be there than it is to be down in the house, the beautiful house, the beautiful mansion with that contentious woman. And what's interesting here about the word roof, it's the word, uh, it, this is a kind of interesting and funny too, it's the word gag, okay? G-A-G, -G, gag, okay? So again, uh, you know, be it up on that roof, you're going to be gagging because you have to be there rather than living down in the house, which is ultimately being up there is a better thing than being down, uh, you know, with the woman inside the house. And then when we have it in verse 19, they change it from what? being on the roof over to being in a desert land, being out in the wilderness somewhere. And that word, too, also talks about being out in the open air. Mibar is the Hebrew word there, and it, and it can be used for uh, you know, different types of terrain, but basically it's saying out in the open somewhere. Not that you have a tent, not that you have you know, a lean-to that you can live under. You're just out there in the open and you're, you, know, uh, you're, you can, uh, are, are there and you can succumb to the climate, to the elements, to all of those things. So again, in this scripture, it's better to be in those environments than it is to be with this type of person. And again, if you've ever been with a contentious woman or if you've ever been with an arrogant male as well, who, you know, it's all about them all the time, you know what this is like. And you don't want to be around that person at all, whether it be male or female. You want to get away with them at, uh, you know, uh, at all costs. You want to get away from them at all costs. You want nothing to do with them whatsoever. So again, it's better to be out in those uh, elements of uh, you know, uh, a bare environment, those places where, again, bad things can happen to you physically, than it is to be in that mental state of being in a, with a contentious woman inside of a beautiful home. <clears throat> well, when we talk about that word contentious, Madan is the Hebrew word here, and it means contention, dispute, strife. That's the type of person that this, that, that, that this is all about. Again, they're always looking for a fight. They're always trying to pick a fight. They're always looking for a quarrel, and nothing can satisfy them. They're always uptight and angry, regardless of what's going to happen, unless you absolutely bow down to them and worship them and give them everything that they absolutely want and desire. Other than that, nothing's good enough for them. And they argue, they complain, you know, and they murmur. They, uh, and they, again, they beat you up verbally as well, that brawling type of sense as well. They're, they're prone to dispute. They're prone to strife. Uh, they easily anger, argumentative. Again, and as I have up on the board, they are a nag, as we would call it. Always that, that you know, nag, nag, nag. I want this, I want that. Or you didn't do this, or you didn't do that. Or you should do this, and you should do that. That is not the type of woman that ultimately any of you should aspire to be, and I'm sure you don't, uh, but ultimately none of you should be that, especially being believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and having His Word resonant within your soul. Now, what I found also interesting about the word contentious is that it's opposite of what the root word content is all about. Isn't that interesting? And that's why I love our English language. You know, you can take a, a, a word and add a suffix onto it, and the word it comp becomes a completely different word. Again, we should have words like act, and you put a T-I-O-N or an I-O-N at the end of it, and now it's action. Well, in both cases, it's a movement that's happening. So it's a similar type of sense of word. But here we have content, and then you put an I-O-N on the end of it, or a I-O-U-S on the end of it for contentious, and it comes, becomes a completely different word. It's a complete opposite word. And so here what we have is the contentious type of individual, which is the complete opposite of what the root word really is all about, of being content. And that by itself speaks volume, because all of us should be content individuals. You see, if we are content with our life, if we're content with our station in our life, the position that God has given us and put us in, and remember, God has put us where we are today, and so ultimately we should be content with what we are, who we are, how we are, and where we are. And we should be absolutely content with that. That doesn't mean you can't work to better yourself or to have better environment that you may want to live in. Nothing wrong with that either. But always be content. 
and don't make it about who, uh, you know, what you're living, how you have, whether you have riches or whether you do not. It's not about that. You should be content in all situations. And let's turn in our Bibles. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to look at uh, verses 11 through 13. If you're using one of our pew Bibles, it's on the back half of page 156. <clears throat> And just before we uh, read that passage, also, you know, this is the woman that ultimately is not content with her situation. You know, she's not content with her life, what she has, always having to complain, wanting something more. She's not happy with her husband. She's not happy with this. She's not happy with that. And therefore, what does she do? She causes strife and quarrels. She complains. She nags. She's, oh, you got to do this. You got to do that. Or I should have this. Or I should have that. And basically what she's doing is because she's a miserable individual, she's trying to make everybody else around her miserable as well. And she may not be doing that, uh, you know, uh, uh, intently, but that is really what's going on in the subconscious of her mind. And sometimes it is the intent of the individual because I'm miserable, I'm going to make you miserable too. And it all stems from not being content. You see, if you're content, if you're happy with your situation, and you all should be, because you have Bible doctrine, the Word of God, you're saved. You have Christ indwelling you. You've got the Father indwelling you. You've got the Holy Spirit who is indwelling you and empowering you. You should be absolutely content in the position that you are right now, regardless of where you are. And if you're not, then ultimately now the sin nature takes over and you start to quarrel, you start to argue, you start to get angry. And you start to get, and it all stems from arrogance because you think you should have more than what you actually do. So because you're miserable, ultimately you try to make other people miserable as well, whether you do that intently or subconsciously, but that is also the result of what the nagging, complaining type of wife does is that she makes everybody around her miserable, especially her husband and probably the family. And then if other, fa other people are witnessing that, whether it be friends that are over or family me members that are over and they see the wife nagging, 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 again, everybody, just a, you know, it's a Debbie Downer for everybody. And it just bums everybody out. So, as you know, the principle of misery likes company, well, this is the miserable type of uh, a person who's not content with her situation, and she wants company, she wants other people to be miserable along with her as well. But yet we know from uh, doctrinal principles and from the Word of God, and again, what we'll, we'll study in uh, chapter 31 when we get there in the book of Proverbs, that there is no creature more lovely than a woman who exhibits the grace of God, who has loving kindness in her life, who is content in her situation and is content in the plan that God has for her life. There is no woman that is lovelier than that as we all should have that type of contentment. Let's now look at Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 11 through 13. And I'm sure you're very familiar with this passage, but uh, this is Paul speaking. And he, once again, he says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. You see, that's the secret. It's right there. The secret is look to Christ. Rely upon Christ, trust in Christ, trust upon His Word, trust upon His Spirit that is indwelling you, and utilize that strength and power each and every day. Rather than putting your eyes on your situation or your circumstance, excuse me, put your eyes on the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when you are occupied with the person of Jesus Christ, then ultimately everything else doesn't matter. Everything else is going to go to the wayside. And you're going to see the life that God has given to you. You're going to have fulfillment in your spiritual walk and in your physical walk. You're going to have complete fulfillment in your life. And then, oh, by the way, when you have contentment as a wife and uh, stop nagging your husband and stop browbeating him and stop beating him up verbally for all the things he doesn't do or hasn't done for you, you're also going to see a different response from your husband as well. And rather than him trying to remove himself from you and getting further and further away from you in a relationship or, you know, trying to distance himself, you know, and uh, which could culminate in divorce, but many times it's just, I don't want to have anything to do with you or I want to be occupied with other people. 
Again, if you stop the nagging and if you have contentment and peace within your soul and show that love, that impersonal, unconditional love where you're to serve other people, you're going to see a change in Him. And He's going to respond. And now the things that you wanted or desired and maybe thought you needed before from Him, now you're going to see them coming from Him. And you're going to see him giving those things to you as a result. But as long as you complain and nag and whine and murmur and continue that, you're just pushing him further and further away. So again, you know, uh, it it, it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, and you just keep continue in your own self-induced misery by making things worse and worse and worse by murmuring, nagging, complaining, and all these other things that we're talking about. So the woman who lacks thoughtfulness, who lacks kindness, again, and she uh, lacks love, seems like, you know, that's not the normal type of person. But again, we do see those people from time to time within our lives. And we see the contentious and angry woman, no matter how physically attractive she may be, she is beyond words disagreeable. Again, no matter how beautiful a woman can be, if she's, you know, uh, I wish I could say something else right now, but if she's a downright nag, okay, and that's all she does, and that's what she's doing all the time, regardless of how beautiful she may be. You're going to be, you know, she's going to turn your stomach, and you're not going to want to have anything to do with that individual. And oh, by the way, you know, if she's not already your wife, you shouldn't have anything to do with that type of individual, because you don't want a life that is coupled to that type of individual. If you're a man, you know, and uh, single, and uh, still in the process of uh, looking for a woman to marry. Again, you want to marry the woman that has doctrine in her soul that applies that doctrine with peace, happiness, contentment, love, and also respecting her husband or future husband as she absolutely should, uh, serving him as much as she possibly can. So again, this type of woman is very disagreeable, and where there is an argumentative woman who seeks to rule and will not be content unless she has things her own way, Again, the whole home is going to be very unpleasant. Everybody is going to be dissatisfied. And that's going to filter down to the kids, and it's going to then filter out to the neighbors as well, family and friends and anybody else who may come in uh, to that periphery around you. So in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 15, it says, A constant dripping on a, on a day of steady rain and a contentious woman are alike. We've noted this verse previously because we've already talked in previous chapters about the contentious woman. But again, that constant... Let me do it a little louder so you can hear it. (laughs) See, if I did it two or three times, it wouldn't bother you. But see, if I keep doing it. (laughs) See, right now you're saying, okay, we get the point. Stop. (laughs) Do you really get the point? All right, I'll stop. I think you get the point. But in any case, ultimately, that's what this type of woman is. Now, in verse 16, I love what it says there. It says, he would, talking about the husband, he would restrain her. Oh, excuse me. He who would restrain her, let me say it the right way. He who would restrain her restrains the wind and grasps oil with his right hand. So again, if you're trying to stop this contentious type of woman from being a contentious individual, it's like this. You're trying to grab the wind. You know, who can grab the wind? You can't hold the wind. You can't do anything with it. And then I like what it says, too, with your right hand, not not your two hands. You see, with your two hands, you can dip it into a bucket of oil, and you can have that olive oil, and you can do something with it. But when you just have one hand, you're like this. I can't do anything. So in other words, you know, you can't change the individual. You can't change the individual. And many people get into marriage thinking they're going to change their husband or their wife. And occasionally, maybe it does happen. But very few times are you going to change that individual. And so therefore, you know, the point is, is they need to change themselves. And the only way they can change themselves is with doctrine within their soul, with the Word of God resident within their soul, so that they lose that misery that they have within their soul. They understand. Uh, peace and happiness in, in the plan and word of God, and then therefore gain contentment within their soul. But the man who tries to change that contentious woman, again, you're grabbing at the wind. You can't do it. You're grabbing at that oil, you, you know, you're going to have nothing. And again, when you think of grabbing the oil, your hands are going to get all messy. You're not going to have any result of grabbing it other than a messy hand. And it's just going to be dripping and oozing and, again, make things even worse for you. 
So uh, that's what we have. And then in the second half, uh, it says, in a house shared with a vexing woman, especially when we get to verse 19, this vexing, again, the Hebrew word there is kaas, and kaas means anger, vexation, or grief. And this is that constant complaining over the littlest things. She's trying to create misery, trying to, you know, uh, you know, jab you to make you feel bad for not doing this or not doing that. And ultimately, she's jab, 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 jab. And as I have also up on the board, this is the type of uh, person. Again, that vexing individual is a type of person who provokes irritability. They provoke anxiety. And what they're doing is making a mountain out of a molehill. You know, they, they look at the littlest things and try to complain, well, you didn't do this, or you didn't do that, or I don't have this, or I don't have that. They make a mountain out of a molehill, rather than being, you know, looking at it as a situation of, you know, this really doesn't matter. You know, what matters is my relationship with the Lord and me going forward in His plan. And the Lord is the one who gives, the Lord who is one that takes away. So I shouldn't be, you know, all over my husband as a result of what I have or what I don't have. I should be all over the Lord. And it's between he and I. But ultimately, you should also have contentment knowing that the Lord is the one that has given what you have. And the Lord is also the one that uh, keeps you in the position that you're in. Especially, again, if you're going forward inside the plan of God. So as we put these two verses together in Proverbs 21 in verses 9 and 19, we note that it is better to live by yourself in some secluded area than to live in a tumultuous house with a wife who is contentious. And that also means quarrels and uh, disputes and makes you annoyed and upset, and upset over relatively unimportant matters, causing you anxiety and distress. And so that's what this kind of contentious woman is all about. That's what she brings to the table. And uh, literally, this is, uh, you know, the type of woman that uh, people should not be looking for. And here's a good example of that contentious woman, okay? I think Sue gave me this uh, back in one of the words a few, few months ago. But again, as we have, again, it's better to live in, alone in the corner of an attic than with a quarrelsome wife in a loving, loving home. So again, you don't want to get your head beat up with a rolling pin, okay? You don't want to be living with this contentious wife. So again, if you are single looking for a wife, you know, have your eyes wide open, have discernment, and don't you know, lock on to that type of woman as beautiful as she may be. If she's contentious, again, it's going to be very hard for her to change. But if she changes with doctrine in her soul over time, then maybe you can uh, take the next step and uh, you know, enter into engagement with that individual. And then also uh, for uh, those who may be living with a contentious woman already, again, the best thing you can do is pray, 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 and make sure she's getting doctrine on a consistent basis. Again, continue to get the Word of God into her life because that is the only thing that's truly going to change. Again, we cannot change people, but the Word of God can. So as it says in verse uh, 17, verse 1, better is a dry morsel in quietness with it than a house full of feasting with strife. And remember when we studied that, it's better to have, you know, meager means within our household, but yet to have peace and happiness and love and that contentment within our household, rather than having a house that's full of strife, even though you've got all the riches in the world. And again, this is also very important for anybody that uh, uh, is uh, currently raising a daughter. And uh, because, again, you, you know, how we raise our daughters, we can raise our daughters to be content with life, or we can raise our daughters to be spoiled brats. And many times, uh, you know, people, you know, we love our daughters, we love our sons, and we want to give them everything we possibly can. But you know what? To give them their every wish and desire is not the best thing for them, because then they just become accustomed to it. And then they look at whoever they're going to marry, and they want that man to provide all those things for them. And then if they don't, then if they go crying to mommy and daddy once again. And they look for mommy and daddy to provide those things for them when the husband cannot. So again, they become very spoiled brats. And the worst thing you can do is try to pawn that type of daughter off onto another man, because it's going to be nothing but misery for her and for him. So again, you know, you know, have discernment. Have discernment as you're raising your children, not to make them spoil brats where they become the contentious type of woman. And ultimately, you know, also continue to take in doctrine as consistently as possible so that we can learn how, how to be content in all situations. And, and when we find ourselves, because we all do it, we all want to quarrel, we all want to argue, we all want to, you know, uh, take our ball and go home, as we would say. You know, we all feel bad in certain situations and we want other people to pay as a result of that. 
But again, we need to check that off and say, you know what, you know, this isn't, you know, an issue here, you know. And, uh, you know, confess the sin and then move forward in the plan of God. You know, don't let the mountain, uh, the molehill become a mountain. So uh, let me just read you something uh, that was uh, uh, written, put together by Rod Matun in his uh, uh, commentary in the book of Proverbs called Treasury of, the, of Scriptures and the Treasury of Proverbs. He goes on to say, he says, God's plan for the wife is to be an encouragement and help to her husband. Men need attention. They need affection, adoration, and admiration. And again, so women, if you think that, you know, if you're complaining about your husband because he's a little baby, well, the answer is he is. And he needs all this attention and all this care. And if you don't give it to him, then who is? It says, a wise wife will endeavor to daily meet these needs of her husband. Some of the cockiest men that I have ever met are very insecure men. Behind men that have accomplished great things and have become very successful are usually very supportive, loving, and caring wives. Yet if the wife becomes embittered, cold, unfeeling, uncaring, or unfaithful, she creates distress and distractions for her husband. Her bitterness or coldness may be caused by sin that has gripped her heart or by her husband who has been acting like a jerk. When husbands are harsh and patient and selfish, they create emotional barriers and, uh, with their spouses. Like rose petals that have been damaged by rough treatment, the tender emotions of a wife can be bruised or scarred. If you have, a bruised, or if you have bruised your wife physically or emotionally, then seek her forgiveness. Give her time to emotionally heal. In most cases, it takes time for her spirit to trust you and to open back up to you once again. So here we see that the gracious woman is a woman of appreciation. She appreciates the things that the husband does do. She appreciates the things that God is doing for her each and every day. And she is also a woman of great affection. And again, you know, most men, that's all they want. That's all they want is the affection of their wife. And they want somebody to hold them. They want somebody to cuddle with them. They want somebody to be with them each and every day. And they want somebody to encourage them because it is very difficult to go out into the world and try to earn a living. And again, uh, many of you are, uh, might be working out in the world. You know what it's like to be out there in Satan's cosmic system. And the same goes for women who may be working. You know what it's like to be out there in Satan's cosmic system and everybody beating you down, beating you down. And again, if the husband's out there earning the living, again, you know what it's like. And again, he doesn't want to come home and get beat down even more. And the same goes for, you know, the wife who's home with the kids all day, who've been screaming and uh, complaining, and she's been taking care of them or whatever the case. Or maybe she's been on the job. She doesn't want to come home and also be beaten down by her husband at night. Again, that's not what marriage is all about. So again, it's about, you know, a general respect for one another. It's that loving kindness for one another. It's the caring. It's the tenderness. And that's how our marriages should come together. And again, as I said, what most men want is just somebody that will care for them and pay attention to them and help them to overcome you know, the problems and difficulties that they need to face each and every day. So wives are to be women of virtue and wives are to be women of great content. And again, virtue and content, that's what we've been studying about, especially in these last uh, two uh, chapters of the book of Proverbs. But the whole, cha- the whole book is all about that and the whole Bible is about that. Again, content and virtue. Honesty, righteousness, justice, love, all those things, tender, 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 loving kindness. And then also, as I have on the board, to be a peacemaker. You know, rather than creating the war, you know, let's be the peace broker to end the war. You know, let's you know, wave the white flag. And let's be that individual that brings peace to a situation rather than making it even worse. As Proverbs 11, and, uh, uh, verse 16, uh, verse 22, chapter 12, verse 4, chapter 18, 22, and 1914, we've studied these already uh, in regard to being a peacemaker and having the loving wife within the home. And then we'll see it also in Colossians 3.18. And then I'm going to have you turn. Let's go to the book of Ephesians right now. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, all the way through 33, basically. And then in 1 Peter chapter uh, 3, verse 1 through 6. If you're using one of our pew Bibles, Ephesians 5 is on page 153. 
And as you're turning to that, I'll also remind you of Proverbs 11:16a, where it says, a gracious woman attains honor. You see, the, the, the contentious woman has dishonor. And nobody wants to be around that individual. But the gracious woman, she attains honor. And people look up to her and people seek her out for her advice and counsel, her opinion. And they treat her with dign- dignity and respect at the same time. In Proverbs 12, 4, in the first part, it says, An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. And again, the excellent wife is a crown of her husband. Going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when we, uh, again, uh, studied this uh, passage as well, remember Eve was the helpmate to the husband. You know, she was there to, to help him, help him with his daily tasks, his daily needs, his daily struggles that he would go through. Help him, help him, help him in all situations. And when she does, she's his crown. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, Wives, be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. And remember how we talked about working and doing our jobs unto the Lord? Well, we should treat our husbands as if they were the Lord as well. And how would you treat the Lord Jesus Christ? How would you treat Him? Would you nag? Would you complain? Would you whine? Well, some women would, okay? But most women probably would not. And they would treat him with honor, with dignity and respect. And that's why we even see Sarah, you know, speaking of Abraham, she called him what? Lord. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. And again, that should be the mentality of our soul. And again, this isn't me saying, it's God saying. So again, oh, the knife, take it out of the back, please. (laughs) All right, let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 22. Again, it says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Again, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Verse, uh, uh, jump down to verse 32. Because we're going to skip over the men. But men, you have responsibilities too. That's for another day. In Ephesians 5, verse 32, it says, This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ in the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So again, this is again how we function and operate unto the Lord. And I know in our day and age of uh, you know women burning their bras as they did back in the '60s and the women living and all that stuff going on. Again, you know this isn't a popular message in our day and age. But you see, it's not our day and age that we're talking about. We're talking about the Lord, which is the eternal Word. You know, so this is for the entire history of the human race, not just past generations. All right, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. It's page 188 if you're using our pew Bibles in the, in the back half. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 1. First Peter 3, uh, in verse 1 through 6, it says, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. So again, if your husband sins, what do you do? Put his sin up on the wall and you know, make a big issue out of it? Or do you give him grace and cover his sin? And don't air the dirty laundry or don't even bring it up to him. But you operate in righteousness. Don't get involved in the sin that he may be sinning in, but you operate in righteousness. And show him what the spiritual life is all about. Again, that he may be one. In verse 2, it says, As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not be merely external braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses. Again, it doesn't say you shouldn't do those things. You can do those things, but it's not only those things. In verse 4, but let it be what? The hidden person of the heart 
with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in the former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. So in other words, you know, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord. And if the husband goes off on a sin, again, you know, don't, don't run him down. If you don't have what you may think you, uh, you know, deserve in this life, again, don't nag and complain. You know, take it up with the Lord. Pray about it. Maybe the Lord will give it to you. But it's God's issue, not your husband's issue. As long as he's out there, again, doing what he should be doing, uh, uh, you know, walking also in the Word of God. So again, that contentious wife is uh, something that we should not be, uh, and uh, ultimately we should be a wife that is full of content, full of peace, love, and kindness within our hearts and within our soul, so ultimately so that we glorify the Lord in our everyday walk. All right, so we'll close there, and we'll pick it up on uh, Tuesday with more Proverbs, but let's just uh, close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time of uh, praise and worship. We thank you for this word. And we thank you, Father, for the beautiful women that uh, are in our local assembly who are going forward in godly principles. And, Father, we just ask that you continue to strengthen each and every one of them with your word and with your spirit so they continue to walk glorifying you as they also uh, walk uh, chaste unto their own husbands or potentially even their future husbands. So, Father, we thank you for this time. And we also pray for the husbands in this uh, local assembly that they also know how to love their wives as they love themselves and treat them with honor, dignity, and respect and hold them up on a pedestal high for the great blessing that you have given to them by providing their helpmate to them. So, Father, we thank you for the time we've had together. We ask that you bless the closing portions of our service this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you very much for that portion. Now's our time where we take of an offering. See, that wasn't so bad, was it? That wasn't so bad. <laughs> All right, so uh, now's the time where we uh, take of our offering. And as you know, uh, it's our time to give back to God the first fruits of all that He has given to us. As I have, as we've uh, studied previously in Proverbs chapter 3, in verses 9 to 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Again, all the material blessings that God gives to you, so that your bonds will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And basically, we, we would say our bank accounts are filled to the brim. And if we have a heart of giving, God will bless us so that we can continue to give. And then we'll also reap a blessing from that for our own, uh, uh, our own desires and our own pleasures as well. So again, now is the time where we have an opportunity to, to give to the Lord. So let's just pray for our offering right now. So, Father, we thank you for this time of praise and worship. We thank you for this time of offering the first fruits of all that you've given to us. And we offer these things to you, Father, in uh, enjoyment, in pleasure. And we ask that you utilize these things so that the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, can be glorified and proclaimed far and wide through these doors and of our local assembly. So, Father, we thank you for this time of giving. In Christ's name, amen. All the way my Savior leads me 